From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events as reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome to yet another edition of Chicago Newsroom here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis, and I hope you had a wonderful Labor Day weekend. It's sort of an, it's always that feeling that the season begins anew, that we get down to business and get even busier than we were. And there will be lots of things to be discussing in the news today. It might be worth mentioning that it was a year ago, almost to the day that we began the modern version of uh, Chicago Newsroom, our first weekly show. So uh, against all odds, we've been doing this for a year. and. <laughs> We decided that it would be appropriate to have a, a, a you know, a celebration. It's our first birthday. But uh, we didn't want to do helium because, you know, there's a worldwide <laughs> shortage of helium. So I thought we would just have the balloon just drop in like this. And uh, we, we thought one would be, there shouldn't be more than one because there are so many people having hard times and we didn't want to spend resources that shouldn't be spent otherwise. <laughs> so it's a kind of a somber first birthday. But welcome to our <laughs> First anniversary show. <coughs> Happy birthday to us here on Chicago Newsroom. Ben Jarovsky joining us. Utterly coincidentally, Ben was uh, a guest on that very first show a year ago. So sure. it's good to see that we're both sort of in the business. Sure. Ben, we've survived another year. Another year, kind of. <laughs> and Kate Grossman also joining us. Kate Grossman from the editorial desk at the Pulitzer Prize winning Chicago Sun Times. And uh, Ben, of course, with the uh, soon-to-be Pulitzer Prize-winning Chicago Reader. So we're, uh, we're glad to have both of you with us today. You know, uh, I called Ben, just picked up the phone and called him. The moment that I heard our mayor say that uh, essentially the TIF program had been reformed, that uh, there was no need to worry anymore about TIFs. He, he realized that the program had a lot of problems in the past, but those problems have been solved, so everybody can calm down now. And I just picked up the phone and called Ben and said, I want to have you on the show since you are Mr. Tiff in this town. Yeah. And you've written more words about it than anybody else. Believe so that. what's going to happen to you, Ben? Will you still have a job? Oh, no, I'm out of work. As of now. To, I'm going to be begging Kate for You'll have to work on some times. other project. Um, no, so, uh, tiffs are reformed. Yeah, tiffs are reformed. Yeah, when you called, as I told you, I was at Rush Street celebrating. <laughs> we were overturning cars. Um, <laughs> the great celebration. Yeah, so no, I actually, because uh, I've written a couple times since the, the great reform happened. Uh, I don't see it as a reform in any uh, measurable way, any significant way. Um, I guess the most significant thing that the mayor's, uh, what is it, his task force and TIFs recommended doing is to uh, release more information in a uh, more user-friendly manner, which I always welcome because having, you know, had a scrounge for this information for all these years, uh, well, it'll be nice to know that they do that. But the, the fundamental problems with the program remain, and the, the biggest problem is the inequity, uh, the way TIFs programs are set up. The wealthier neighborhoods get um, the great majority of the TIF dollars, and the poor neighborhoods, which could use the TIF dollars the most, get uh, the least amount. Um, the most obvious example being like Englewood mm -hmm. or Roseland um, versus the Loop. Don't, not, don't want to bore you, Ken, on your show and your anniversary <laughs> show with a detailed explanation of why this is so. Just trust me, one there's of, a flaw in the ointment. One of your <laughs> life's burdens oh, is that God. you have to constantly apologize <laughs> for the fact that you're going to be talking about <laughs> tips. Or no, explaining can, them. And explaining them, and you can see people's <laughs> eyes glowing over and say, I'm supposed to know no, this uh, and understand uh, this, but I'll, oh I'll go God. ahead, Ben. <laughs> no, 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 no. Trust me, I won't do it. Just trust me. There's this huge inequity in the program. Well, and, uh, but. But seriously, the mayor has said that there's now going to be <clears throat> an internal governing body, whatever that means, that'll take care of uh, looking at things. Um, <clears throat> they're going to be talking about benchmarks, which I wrote down. They include uh, uh, job creation, uh, private investment, property value increases, worker training, and new affordable housing. The new internal governing body will look at each TIF and evaluate whether it reaches those goals. And if it doesn't, presumably that TIF will be I don't know, phased out or improved yeah. or changed or something. But of course, we don't know who that governing body yeah. is other than Carol Brown at this yeah, point. Yeah, at this point, I have to say, first of all, we already have these uh, oversight bodies in place. We have our, uh, an alpha called the Community Development Commission. Again, not wanting to bore you with how the process <laughs> works, but they presumably, in uh, conjunction with the city, 
uh, oversee every single TIF that's created, every single deal uh, that's created. We presumably have uh, hordes of lawyers uh, going over the contracts on redevelopment deals. So they're just sort of uh, reinventing what they already have and calling, repackaging and calling it something else. Um, the reality is that, that uh, the TIF program represents uh, what is it, about $500 million a year, roughly, right. give or take, uh, in property tax dollars that is pretty much at the disposal of the mayor. And so um, uh, I've been saying this for a while now, but Mayor Emanuel is not going to give that up. That's just too much money. What mayor could? Right? Yeah, what, what mayor, mayor could? could walk into Rich Daly's shoes and say, well, I don't think we need this. Yeah, I don't think we need this. I'm going to give it back to the Board of right, Education. Right. I'm going to give the it the Park District. Yeah. And so, all yeah, so this, the TIF program will exist. Now, what Mayor Emanuel chooses to spend the money on at this moment is unclear. His, uh, it's interesting, uh, they have this new ta task force that's promising to do this, that, and the other thing. Well, the first venture uh, under Ma Mayor Emanuel was to uh, give money uh, for a venture right down the street from where we are now in Greektown. Uh, they're going to put a, uh, uh, a shopping center, or a grocery store, excuse me, across the street from an already existing grocery store in this uh, h horribly blighted community known as Greektown. <laughs> so already he's flunked the first, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I guess, I guess the reform not is exactly happening after, desert, uh, yeah, it? yeah, not exactly a food desert. Yeah. So uh, if, 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 if uh, in a perfect world, uh, we just get rid of the TIF program and go, uh, in my humble opinion, case by case. So if you have a development deal that you truly, really think deserves mm -hmm. some kind of city subsidy, then you could create a TIF for that particular deal and the TIF would end as soon as the deal is done. But um, the program is r largely designed to create, as I said, $500 million a year or so in property tax for the mayor to spend. So as long as the program exists that way, um, the mayor is going to take advantage Did of it. Did you see at the, at the end of the report they had some ideas about enlarging or advancing TIFs or something? To your point about this uh, in inequity, it was a little vague, but they talked about sort of this notion of you know taking tips from you know the money from the loop tip and putting it over there. I mean, when you did any of those ideas, I mean those would all require presumably changes in Springfield. Did any of those? Well, what you should do, if if you view TIF dollars uh, as economic development dollars, and that we're in a hard times, so we have very little uh, of these money around, then what you should do is say, okay. We're going to fold the TIF into the general budget, and we're going to have every year <clears throat> an annual appropriation for economic development that will come out of the property tax that people pay. And, uh, and then we'll uh, apportion that money in some kind of equitable manner uh, so that uh, poor neighborhoods, wealthy neighborhoods, well, wealthy neighborhoods really don't need it, um, but poor and middle class, working class neighborhoods get some sort of uh, equal share. Um, they don't want to do that for many reasons. Um, the number one reason would be that it would cause the property tax, the city's share of the property tax to go up and then people would be blaming them. So the, another great flaw of the TIF program is shields an increase in the property tax. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, every year that a TIF is in existence, it forces all the tax, taxing bodies, the Board of Ed, the Park District, the county, to raise their tax rates so that they can divert this extra money into the TIF fund. So if you ended the TIF program and just put it on the burden on the, of the city, which is what they're kind of talking about, mm -hmm. then that would force the t city to raise its taxes. So they want uh, their cake and eat it too. This is Mayor Daley's great vision. Um, the, it's the miracle program that creates money without raising taxes. That was the city's official line. Mm -hmm. I will say this, uh, in defense of Mayor Emanuel's TIF task force, um, they're actually the first city entity I've ever seen that openly acknowledges that TIFs raise taxes. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. They kind of bury that in. I mean, I think I guess it's just important, <clears throat> just sort of colloquially, uh, to, to explain that the whole the whole reason TIFs have become so controversial is that for some period of time, 17 years, 19, 21 years, whatever it is, money that would have come from this particular area that would have gone to the parks, to the schools, to individual taxing bodies other than the city, doesn't the increases in that taxes don't go there yes. anymore. So the Board of Education, for example, uh, which has just had to raise taxes, has had to raise taxes largely because the money that it normally would right. have been receiving is not coming to it because it's going to the tips, yeah. which are then going to development projects, some of which are right. very But then the city argues they, you know, they've set up in this report, they set up different ways to evaluate mm -hmm. how, how successful the tips are. And so one of them is growth and property values. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. argue in there that, you know, in the tips, the majority of tips, there have been growth in property values 
at a rate higher than the rest of the city. Right. So yeah. therefore, you're going to gen so potentially right. you're going to well, generate more. Yeah. yeah. See now, <laughs> this is where I just <laughs> descend into the, the bowels <laughs> of Tipton. Well, absolutely. That's I mean. I know that's, you're just echoing what they're yeah. saying, but of course you're going to have more growth in a TIF district than a non-TIF district because a TIF district is gerrymandered to include that portion of an area that's the least developed. They do it in purpose. One, they have to make the TIF district uh, correspond to the state law, which loopholes and all mm -hmm. says that there are some uh, restrictions on. So what they do is they'll draw a district so if you have a brand new uh, shiny skyscraper that was just built last year the TIF boundary will go around, around. it to exclude it mm -hmm. and circle the vacant lot and so that's how they justify creating the TIF like the LaSalle Central TIF which is just across the river from where we are now or and that's how they justify creating a TIF in a well-to-do neighborhood so yes they they intentionally take the least developed land so that when appreciation happens, they'll get the most amount of money. And so really... But the point, too, is, though, that it... I mean, I get your point. Obviously, they, they draw a circle they and leave the... Right. But, but that area was undeveloped and not generating as much tax revenue, right? Well, what so you have to ask yourself as uh, investors, and that's what we are, because as taxpayers, we are investing our tax dollars in this, or the Board of Education has to ask itself, is if I have a vacant lot, that's across the street from a recently developed skyscraper, would, developed would anyway? that be developed anyway? Right. And I think, yes, it would be developed anyway. So it's not really in my best interest as a investor to give more of my property dollars over to a fund that's right. going to develop a vacant lot in a gentrifying neighborhood. And what makes that argument more poignant is that when you look at the history of the program over the last 10 years or so, there are many fewer of these kind of projects happening in areas where Arguably, they really needed this kind of thing. Well, well you don't get as much to. I mean, there's a lot of TIFs in poor neighborhoods. Yeah, they, just right. they just don't generate. They don't generate, the generate that and, much. Yeah. Right. Shall we move on? Go ahead. Let's move on Although because I could talk about TIFs all day. I know, again. I know, but, but <laughs> that must be a lot of fun. Uh, cocktail uh, parties. <laughs> huh? um, let's talk though about this. Uh, just as we were walking in the door, Kate, you said you just got a you just got a text that there is a fourth school that has signed on to Mayor Emanuel's revolution. <laughs> uh, to, um, I think that was a Tribune term. <laughs> yeah, four Did schools. Say that? Oh yeah, four <laughs> schools of the uh, thousand or so <laughs> Chicago public schools have now signed on to longer school days, and um, I mean I think there are so many aspects of this that we need to talk about. But one of them that I think that might be a good place to kick off is the Chicago Teachers Union, because I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that this appears to be. Uh, a very skillful attack on the prerogative of the Chicago Teachers Union. I mean, I can't see how you could see it any other way. Uh, I, it reminds me very much of kind of the daily Emanuel method of undercutting aldermen, mm -hmm. that you set up a 911 and a 311 and, and you say to people, look, if a street light's out, you don't really need to call the alderman. You can call us. We'll put you in the database. We'll take care of it. And gradually, over a period of time, the aldermen begin to look around and say, wait a minute, you know, I, now, now the garbage is being kicked, picked up on a grid. I don't, I don't have any of these prerogatives anymore. It seems to me that they're doing the same kind of thing. It's analogous, anyway, right. to the teachers' union. They're saying, here, here yeah. this, school, this school, we can pick off this school, we can pick off right. this school, and pretty soon the authority of the union will be diminished. Is that unreasonable? Uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good analogy. I mean, there's no question the manual administration sees the union as a total roadblock, not a partner in any fashion. They're, they're just completely trying to go around them, um, which, you know, is unfortunate, although I don't think the union has given any signs that they're interested in being anything, unfortunately, but a roadblock. Um, I, you know, technically speaking, what these schools do is there, there's a waiver in the contract if mm -hmm. you, if enough, 51% of the teachers vote, mm -hmm. which now they've done at four schools, um, they can, you know, extend the school day. Um, so, you know, on a technicality, I guess they're not going around the union. But, um, but you know, ever since Emmanuel, you know, he made it very clear during the campaign that this was his number one priority for the schools was mm -hmm. to lengthen the school day. And the teachers' union has been utterly resistant to it from the very beginning, uh, while acknowledging that it's going to happen because now, because of legislation passed in Springfield last year, that they can do it. They have mm -hmm. to negotiate mm -hmm. the 
uh, economic impact of mm -hmm. a longer school day, but they can just unilaterally lengthen the school day. Um, it's an intense public relations war that's it going sure on is. right now yeah. Um, yeah. with a manual throwing out facts, which are often exaggerated, mm -hmm. um, about you know how deprived the school system is, you know, in the length of its day. Though he's he exaggerates, but I think in general he's right. Mm -hmm. Chicago has compared in Illinois and around the country one of the shorter school days, and I think it should be longer. And I think probably most teachers probably agree it should probably it should be longer. Um, and the teachers union reaction has been we want they've started their own campaign. We want a Better, better, smarter school, school right, day. A longer but better day. Well, yeah, they're not even saying and longer. <laughs> just a better school day. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and they're right on that too. We do need a better school day. And this is sort of the irony. You know, when I talk to Jean Claude Brizard, who's the CEO of CPS, and I talk to Karen Lewis, the head of the teacher, teachers union, they actually really want the same thing. Mm -hmm. They want to move away from sort of this intense test prep focus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the a curriculum that's only math and reading, which squeezes out you know, all the things that get kids really excited the about school, the arts and science yeah. and social studies and mm -hmm. recess, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. um, so they actually really agree, um, but they don't, there's all this <laughs> PR stuff in the middle and Emmanuel, who's not a nuanced guy, mm -hmm. uh, as mm -hmm. we all know. And so, um, you know, what's happening, I think, is really unfortunate because I think Karen Lewis is you know, she's an excellent teacher. She could bring so much to the table of, to CPS about what what a what a better school day would entail and right now they're just at loggerheads and so they're just going around and picking like you said picking off all these schools um, and you know putting pressure on the schools that's what CTU is alleging putting pressure on the schools and I'm sh of course they are they're working all the back channels to get as many schools as they possibly can amazingly they can come up with the money too for it right uh, when they need it here's 150 <laughs> K here here's 150 K here here's two percent yeah. for you two percent for right. you but oh there's no money for raises we don't have that and <laughs> you know the the um, the mystery of the of the school deficits that uh, you know uh, Huberman said we had a billion dollar deficit this year and suddenly all of a sudden it's uh, we don't have it anymore. Right. So, Although I mean, I mean that's he grossly was, oversimplified. But. Right. But I mean part part of I mean first of all we had a seven hundred million dollar deficit this year. The reason Huberman's one billion went down is because CPS went to Springfield and got a holiday on its pension bill and mm -hmm. so we're paying now half of our pension bill and so in 2014 that comes that due. comes you know so he was mm -hmm. he was exaggerating but actually for good reason mm -hmm. because that that money is owed um, uh, and and this all becomes it, it I have to say that there's a point at which this whole thing just becomes almost unfathomable to me I mean <laughs> it, 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 I just I just find myself sitting here saying, "This is about education. This is about this is about our kids. This is about about really the future of everything in mm -hmm. the country," and yet we can't seem to afford to pay people properly to do the job, and we can't keep schools. On. What? Now you've written uh, a lot. Well, about Ken, this. now <clears throat> I'm going to have to interject here. I think this is a uh, power play by Rahm Emanuel, who's a very powerful and savvy political operator. I I don't think Rahm Emanuel ever. Uh, before he became mayor of Chicago, thought about um, uh, policy like educational policy. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think this was a campaign issue that he yeah, came up yeah, with. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to distinguish himself from um, Chico and Del Valle. If we can go back in time, mm -hmm. there was a mayoral election. Mm -hmm. So oh, I'm going to mm -hmm. expand the, uh, um, the, school day. the school day. So then he gets into a fight. Well, Rahm Emanuel, as we all know, loves fights. Mm -hmm. He's a really good fighter. He usually wins the fights mm -hmm. he gets into. So. He's effectively picked a fight with the union. I mean, I agree with pretty much everything Kate said. The only thing I would say, well, they took away the 4% that the previous board had promised. So on top of taking away their 4%, they want them to work more. Mm -hmm. All right, see, mm -hmm. so um, I think that Emmanuel wants to send a message that uh, he was the mayor who uh, conquered the teachers union and forced the schools to um, expand the day. And there was an excellent article in the Sun Times that ran. I think it was this weekend. Esther Cepeda wrote it, and I clipped it out and everything. And mm -hmm. I've been meaning to send her a shout out. So doing the show, I mean, she really pointed out that there's there was no thought given to um, r expanding the school day. There was no, mm -hmm. uh, you know, idea. It was just out of nowhere. Yeah. As you say, it really, it really well, did. That's, um, for, that's a, a little. Promise. It was a campaign promise, but for years 
in all the contract negotiations yeah. with CTU, the Board of Ed has been trying. Daily, daily. To, people right, through design. daily, yeah. been trying, not 90 minutes, but trying mm -hmm. to elongate the school day. Because yeah. we've, yeah. everyone has known for a long time that the school day in Chicago is too short. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I mean, I agree, he picked it up as a campaign issue, but it's not like this issue came out of, out of nowhere. They've okay, been right. well, but I, the I real guess issue is what do you do, and this is what Esther said, what do you do with the day? Yeah. And what can you do with the day with the resources you have? And uh, what are you going to do with that extra time? Are you going to have recess, for instance? A lot yeah. of schools in Chicago don't have recess. Mm -hmm. Are you going to expand your arts program? Are you going to expand your reading program? Do you have the money to do that? I mean, there's a lot of questions about the pragmatic impact it's going to have. And when you see the way it's working out, um, uh, where all of a sudden the school system that's broke has money to effectively bribe schools into uh, undercutting mm -hmm. their union, uh, mm -hmm. bribe teachers into cutting their union, um, then you, you, you do become very jaded. And moreover, you can't overlook the fact that um, a lot of teachers, a lot of younger teachers are probationary teachers. This is a Chicago political move. You're probationary teachers, your, your entire future is hinged on the recommendation you get from your principal. Your principal. If your principal walks in in the classroom and says, I want a longer day. I need you. I, I need, I need your, your vote. vote. Right. Well, come right. on. It's right. like it's, you only it's need one, 51 percent. You know right? what? It's that one that what step. Said? I right. think the analogy we're one step away from Donald Tomczak and how he used to get the sewer <laughs> workers out to for for Mayor Daley and Ron. So we're it's turning our teachers. Well, we're turning our yeah. teachers yeah. into patronage pawns. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The only reason I have some sympathy for Emmanuel on this, although I think his tactics are over the top. It's because, like I said, I've been co covering the Board of Ed for 10 years, and so even before that, they were, they've been trying to lengthen the school day. And the teachers' union has always been resistant, mm -hmm. always saying, mm -hmm. you know, fine, but pay us more. But pay us, yeah. And there's never money. And so what, how do you do it, right? Mm -hmm. We need a longer school day. So how how do you make it happen? Can we, we can we, should we talk about it for another 10 years while well, another group the, the of kids go through school? A couple of questions that come to my mind are, are we need a longer school day. Do we need 90 minutes? No. Was it necessary to do 90 minutes? I Where think did that 90 minutes come is too. See, and this is what's upsetting about Emmanuel. And what do you fill Emmanuel. that 90 minutes with? And and wouldn't if you had resources, wouldn't they be better spent making the regular day better before you expand it, or maybe expand it a little, find something in the yeah. middle there somewhere? And also the thing that's still on the table at the end. I know you've editorialized about this, but I mean, I don't think it's unfair to say. If you were working in the parts depot and you were working, you know, 80, 40 hours a week and somebody came along and said, oh, we're going to extend your work day by 90 minutes a day, uh, you'd say, well, then I would want to get 90 minutes more pay. Right. Well, there's but, two things I mean, about that. that. Well, in, first of all, though, it would seem to. Of course, well, maybe in, a, in today's uh, America, you right. wouldn't do that. You're lucky you have a okay, job. Yeah. Yeah. Think, do right. Get to keep well, my job? two things about that. Number one, the teacher's day would only be 40 minutes longer than it currently is. So the kids will be there 90, but the teachers have to, you know, be there longer before the kids come and they stay okay. a little after. So they'd only be working 40 more. Plus, um, Chicago public school teachers make comparable sal salaries to teachers in other school districts that work a longer day. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not, you know, and I'm going to be called a teacher basher because, of course, I want, in the perfect world, yeah, you pay them, they're going to work 40 more minutes, you pay them, you know, you pay them more, but we don't really have the money for it. Mm. And so since they're being paid, f you know, for working less, it's not unreasonable to say you have to work huh? more. Okay. You know, and if if you can give if you can give them a pay increase, by all means, do it. But I don't think that this is being fundamentally so unfair. So that's how you get labeled by George Schmidt <laughs> right. and others as yeah. being uh, being union busting, a union busting newspaper I guess that, so. that they once had a proud labor tradition. That's where that comes mm -hmm. from. Anyway, um, we got a couple minutes left. I got to talk about a couple of other things here. As fascinated as I am by this, and could go on for hours. Richard M. Daley apparently will not be deposed, it now appears. Um, what happened? Well, I don't think, well, literally, what did well, happen? Well, we should say, will yeah. not be deposed in the Burge, Burge case. In the Burge okay. case. Okay. Um, as, as, as I understand it, the city uh, filed a motion with the judge saying that uh, they want him removed from the case. And pending the decision by the judge, they're saying we're absolutely not going to allow him to be deposed in this. So it looks like there's, there's at least a possibility that he may not. And the city's argument is? 
Well, the city's argument is that he shouldn't be in the case, I guess. I, I, I mean, don't know. I'm, I haven't read it. Be. But your, your uh, Carol Marine uh, wrote a very right. interesting piece about this yesterday and, and said, in, in her opinion, that he, it's time for him to come clean. It's time for him to talk to the public about what role he did or did not play in covering up or at least looking the other way mm -hmm. during these. Mm -hmm. Right. And I do think the public would like to know. I mean, this case, as Emanuel says, been going on for you know thirty years. Let's get it over with, mm -hmm. <laughs> just like that. Yeah. You know, in that classic uh, rom, right? Yeah. Let's just get it over that's, with. That's brilliant, Rom. He's going to kick the teachers around, but right. oh, we can't have Mayor Daly answer <laughs> one question. He's a real tough guy, isn't he? Right. Well, I wonder Come what's going to happen though, is because he certainly suggested he wants to settle this, and so I don't know if if they're just going to quickly try to move these through settlement as a, mm -hmm. you know because hopefully it's the right thing to do, but also as a way to. You know, right. My understanding Daly's is face. that there are some cases that everyone agrees really just simply cannot and should not be settled, but there are many that could. But whether or not that impacts on the former mayor actually sitting down at well, some point. Well, he was the state's attorney at the time. Some of the most egregious right. uh, yes. torture cases right. happened, and so he should the, yeah. be uh, answering. I don't know why the city is. That's why I was asking, what's the city's argument for right. Uh, right. defending him? I, I want to jump to something. I, I was just so excited to talk to you about this, and we never got enough time to really talk about it. What's good, what do you think about this uh, Daily Herald throwing up a paywall on, on their newspapers? You, 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 guys, you guys give away more free content, the Reader and the Sun-Times, more good quality content every day than probably anybody I can name. And here's the, here's the Daily Herald saying you're going to have to start paying for it. Are they are doing the right thing? I, I sure hope they are. I mean, I'm, I, you know, the New York Times has done it. No offense to the Daily Herald, it's obviously not the same caliber yeah, yeah. of paper, yeah. and so the thinking was, you New York Times will blaze the path and the rest will follow. But wh why the hell not? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, there was a quote in um, in the story you sent from Chuck Gowdy's column, a, a re reporter at the Daily Herald saying, you know, he's thrilled and terrified at the yeah. same time, and that's yeah. kind of how I feel. I don't know what else to do. Yeah. You know, we do all this work and we give it away, and we gotta pay yeah. for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People have to pay for it. So I'm actually happy about yeah. it i'm pleased do you think the sun times would would follow if, if if they if you saw some glimmer of success i mean you know i don't i'm not privy to the business yeah. decisions of the sun times but sure i mean if if the yeah. daily herald can pull it off why why, why can't, can't the, sun the times? you know sometimes well, <coughs> as a loyal subscriber to the sun times uh -huh. have been subscribing to the sun times uh -huh. since the 1980s first thing i read every day is the bright one um starting with the sports section um <laughs> I, w I want them to. I'm sick of subsidizing all these cheapskates who uh, right. get the bright right. one up for free on right. the. If uh, you know, I'm paying for Rick Tlander and Rick Morrissey and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Kate, Kate Grossman <laughs> and uh, uh, Mark Conkle. Uh, so uh, you know, well, they should pay for them too. Yeah. Now the readers in a different bag. We've always been free. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it's free is free is your business model. Yeah. Ben, I'm really sorry. We're going to have to cut you off. It, it happens every week. We get down to this point and we can't believe it. We're going to explain how we, journalism I should know, save itself. I know, and I want to hear how journalism <laughs> can't do it. We'll have to do it another <laughs> okay, time. Tips. Another half hour. We've just wasted another half hour of your valuable time. No, we haven't wasted it at all. Very interesting conversation with Kate Grossman from the Chicago Sun Times editorial board and uh, 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 Ben Jarofsky, of course, from The Reader. Glad to have him here and uh, glad to have you here on this first anniversary show. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV, And of course, you find us here all the time on cable, but you can see some of these and other programs online at cantv.blip.tv. You can check us out there. More important, you can even subscribe on iTunes and listen to it as an audio podcast when you're running along the lake. I'm Ken Davis. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time as we begin our second year of Chicago Newsroom. Take it easy.